and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark, a very special program with a very special guest, my dear friend, author, Father Robert Spitzer, SJ. Our book, Father Spitzer's Universe, Exploring Life's Big Questions, proudly published by EWTN Publishing and naturally available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Welcome, Father, to Bookmark. It's hard not introducing this as part of Father Spitzer's universe, but everything is part of your universe these days, apparently. How are you? Uh, well, no, I'm doing great, and I'm glad to be uh, having my own universe, and, uh, there you go. and of course, this book being part of it. <laughs> right, absolutely, and we were thrilled to be able to put this out. And obviously, uh, exploring life's big questions really is based on the program uh, that I certainly have been privileged to do with you over these many, many years. Now, I can't believe how many years it's actually been, but uh, doing this particular program and thinking back to the early days when the idea came up about doing a program with you at the time and, and us conceiving of something to deal with, I remember, faith and reason uh, and, and talking about how to make That's it right. work and, and trying to do something remotely as we've worked out. And I think uh, people have, uh, have uh, uh, lauded your uh, participation and are, are thrilled with uh, some of the programs, obviously, on a regular basis, and we get a lot of very positive feedback. So it's great uh, to have a book based on a lot of the answers that you, you've proffered over the years. Oh, thanks so much. And uh, uh, that's, that was the intention of the book, is mm -hmm. to uh, take a look at about seven or eight critical areas that we touch on and Father Switzer's universe and just mm -hmm. taking a few of the big topics, as you put it, the big questions mm -hmm. within, uh, within the, uh, uh, that purview. Right. And uh, so uh, I think it's a, a handy little book. It's almost kind of like a, um, a, you know, a variety book of mm -hmm. uh, many of my other books all put together, but with uh, you know, uh, explanations that were really meant um, to be broadcast in an oral right. and audiovisual framework. Right, and in some ways actually uh, made even more understandable for the average person as you have less time to be exactly. able to go uh, into the layers behind it. So I think it's something that, that is more accessible exactly. for the average person. Let me, let me ask you just in, in doing the show, what has been the greatest feedback that you've heard over the years from people talking to you or seeing you at airports or wherever about the program and what they like about the program? Well, um, I hear three major compliments. I mean, um, without being uh, self-aggrandizing here, <laughs> I think uh, our chemistry is the number one. People like the chemistry uh, between us, and they definitely like the, uh, uh, you know, the back and forth, the repartee, even mm -hmm. the humor. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, the, you you see current issues with such a depth, uh, you know, and that really is not one of my strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you you take my knowledge and and apply them to the current issues in such uh, really good ways. People really love that. Mm -hmm. uh, they love the fact that we do a lot of science mm -hmm. uh, on the program. In other words, we're looking at that intersection between faith and reason, faith and science, faith in the natural law, mm -hmm. et cetera. So uh, we do do a lot of, um, touch a lot of areas on big questions that people have, mm -hmm. but we're not scared of using a little bit of science, a little bit of philosophy, a, a little bit of law, and mm -hmm. um, you know, a variety of other things that, that uh, um, you know, sometimes people think, well, that's uh, kind of highfalutin uh, in this program. We use them, and it turns out people actually like it. Mm -hmm. So that's always been a, a, a very good thing. And uh, the third thing uh, I think that people like is we don't mincemeat, uh, you know, with respect to moral issues. We mm -hmm. uh, talk about them straight on, mm -hmm. but we try again to have a perspective uh, that is, uh, you know, a uh, uh, um, you know, a higher viewpoint perspective. We're mm -hmm. trying to look at, uh, you know, issues from, uh, you know, the, the various ethical schools, how this fits in, the various social cultural schools, how that fits in, mm -hmm. and of course the various schools of truth and so forth. So we're trying to look mm -hmm. at, um, you know, things from a higher viewpoint, and a lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, I'd have to say those are the three okay, areas right. that. Uh, that people really appreciate. Right. Yeah, I find it also that people just appreciate having an intellectual understanding and a basis behind the faith of realizing that it oh, yeah. isn't simplistic. 
uh, you know, in that way, and I'm yeah. not naive for believing these things, and that the church actually has these answers and everything does actually fit together. Uh, exactly. Uh, and, and I think uh, there's no one with better answers than the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have so much articulation in every area. As I've said before on many shows, you have over 185 Catholic clergy, most of them priests, who were involved in the development of science. Mm -hmm. We've been involved in that from the beginning, mm -hmm. literally. And, and so just there, we're the only religion that has an academy of sciences mm -hmm. with Nobel Prize winners that have always been part of it, or even uh, have characterized it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've certainly, I, I don't know of anyone who has articulated the philosophy of law the, and, and the philosophy of social ethics like the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Our documents, um, you know, what we call our social encyclicals on the Catholic Church, combined with the background and philosophy of law, uh, we are just like, uh, uh, honestly, I, I can't imagine any other church that, that comes close to it, that touches it. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th this is really comprehensive on every single issue. I mean, again, we're the only church with this huge diversity of uh, spiritualities, mm -hmm. and not just Jesuit and Dominican and Franciscan, but the, the whole contemplative realm that's so articulated, and, and of course, the whole area of con con contemplation and action, the diocesan vocation. I mean, it's, there's just a, a huge complex of, of spiritualities that, that, I mean, who can touch this mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, our tradition? And I could go on and on and on right. and on. Uh, and of course, you know, Catholics in literature, Catholics in the fine arts, Catholics in music, Catholic mm -hmm. clergy in music, and so forth. You just keep going on and on. And, but, it, uh, yeah, the effects on the world have been profound. And it's just a pure pleasure for me to articulate uh, you know, the, 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 the things that not only the church has given the world, but what science has given the world and how it comes together right. with our right. faith and the things that philosophy has given to the world, how it comes together with our faith, etc. And that's been really right. the intention of the show. And uh, you, you were the one that got the, the title of the show. I, I remember we wanted to call it originally Faith and Reason Coast to Coast. Uh, but uh, uh, somehow uh, no, well, wasn't you, me. you found that name Father Spitzer's Universe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it wasn't I, you? I, Okay. I, fa I found it from uh, either Steve Beaumont or the producer at the time, whose name escapes me, came up with that. None of us can remember yeah. who came up with it, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't me. Uh, I'm okay. willing to give credit for that. I, I glom enough credit for oh, things yeah. other people do. I have to be honest about that one. So, uh, <laughs> you know. In, yeah, right, me too, unfortunately. <laughs> so the, the format of this particular book that the Publisher Note puts out is that it's based on mm -hmm. the program. It, it has the same format of that Q&A uh, with kind of a follow-up queries on, on the question. And that kind of, mm -hmm. uh, so if you're interested in the, in the kind of topics we talk about, like talk about uh, God the Father, man, the fall, uh, Jesus Christ, Christians in the world, uh, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. Let me go to one of the ones that probably really was central to the whole idea of this program, which is right at the beginning, uh -huh. which is the proof of God's existence, where the question was, give us a foolproof yeah. argument of the existence of a creator. Is there some proof that even atheists cannot deny, or one particular argument that you find most effective? Yeah, I gave Lonergan's argument there, uh, and the reason I did is because I haven't seen a single atheist criticize it, mm -hmm. but it is an exceedingly well-known argument. Uh, basically, his argument goes, if being is completely intelligible, then God exists. But being is completely intelligible, therefore God exists. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's the general statement. You've got to prove those premises, um, you know, that being is completely intelligible and that uh, if being is completely intelligible, then God exists. And what Lonergan does and what I do in that proof is the first thing you have to establish, number one, is there has to be at least one uncaused reality in the whole of reality. In other words, a being that exists, a reality that exists through itself. If you don't have at least one, then you can easily prove that uh, the whole world would be nothing, right? Mm -hmm. If there doesn't exist at least one being 
that exists through itself that's uncaused, mm -hmm. then the whole of reality is a caused reality. But if the whole of reality is a caused reality, then what's the cause of the whole of reality that's, that are caused realities and, and that is a caused reality itself? Oops, it has to lie outside the whole of reality because it's now part of the whole of reality. Therefore, you know, if the whole of reality is reliant upon it and it's lying outside the whole of reality and therefore is nothing, then nothing exists. It's so easy to prove. No atheist can deny it. But then you just you can go on so easily after that. You can just say, oh, okay, if you have to have one uncaused reality, uh, any uncaused reality is going to have to be unrestricted. Uh, that's a uh, pretty easy proof too. It, it's got three premises. I, I won't uh, go into it right now. Take mm -hmm. up the program. But then you can easily prove that an unrestricted reality has to be unique because if you had two unrestricted realities, one of them would have to have something, be something, be somewhere, be in a dimension that the other one is not. The one that is not that thing mm -hmm. is obviously finite. And that would be a restricted, unrestricted reality, and the, that's a contradiction. So easy to prove right. uh, if you have an unrestricted reality, it's unique. But if you have only, only one uncaused, unrestricted reality, then it's going to have to be the cause of everything else that is, because the rest of reality has to be a caused reality, and those caused realities in their totality will have to be reliant on the one uncaused reality for its existence. I don't think I've ever seen uh, anybody criticize. Now, Lonergan goes on to say, well, what kind of a being can that be? Mm -hmm. Well, it has to be, as it turns out, an unrestricted act of understanding or an unrestricted act of thinking, thinking itself. So the, the first thing um, that Lonergan notices is that if you're going to have an unrestricted reality, it can't be like a physical reality with an empirical residue, right? Material realities, by definition, are finite. But a collection of material realities, likewise, has got to be finite because the whole conglomeration of them is finite. It'll only add up to a finite reality, even multiverses, etc. Then you go on to, you know, different kinds right. of thoughts. The okay. only thing that will be an unrestricted reality then has to be an unrestricted act of thinking, thinking itself. You get away from the restrictedness of material realities. You get away from the restrictedness of merely finite thoughts, finite intelligible reality. So an unrestricted act of thinking is the only one right. that can be truly unrestricted. Okay, great. By the time you're done, you've got to God. There you go. Okay, <laughs> let's keep moving so we can get to a couple of different topics. Sure. The, uh, dealing with the problem of evil, a lot of people talk about God is all knowing. Yeah. He knew his angels of light would be consumed with pride and turned into the devil. Why did he go ahead and create them? And subsequently, the question was, and if God loves us, why did he let him come down here to, to tempt us? Right. So the whole idea, again, is freedom is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the solution, too, because God wanted us to be free. God wanted the angels to be free. God did not want to make a robot mm -hmm. that would mimic his behaviors. He wanted to make a being that has had the capacity to accept and reject him, to accept and reject his love, to accept and reject his moral code or his goodness, etc. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're in the same boat as human beings. God didn't just want to make an automaton, just didn't want to make a robot that would imitate his loving and good behaviors. Mm -hmm. He really wanted us to be able to choose. Well, the minute you give somebody the ability to choose goodness or un not goodness, mm -hmm. uh, they could they could choose uh, non-goodness or evil. They mm -hmm. could choose something unloving. They could choose something contrary to God. So he, he, he wanted to give beings this freedom. Mm -hmm. So he has to uh, give them the possibility of doing evil, doing unloving things and causing suffering, uh, you know, okay. rejecting him and causing other people to reject him. And so that's why he right. did it. And of course, why does he allow those beings to come down and bother us? Because, uh, you know, temptation is part of the game. Mm -hmm. God wanted, you know, as it were, he's inspiring us. Then, of course, evil, uh, he allows evil to inspire us uh, in an even game so we can really choose. Right. If he loaded the dice so that we'd only want to choose him, I rest my case. You wouldn't have a real free choice. Absolutely. So he's got to let the, uh, the other side have its say, and that's why he does it.
Right. Let me ask you, uh, okay, yeah. this is one I followed up on uh, in the section on the fall. Well, Father, we say that God yeah. has unconditional love, but yet even in the case of the prodigal son, he needed to come back and take advantage of that love. Isn't that a condition? Yeah. Well, you know, in a, in a way it is a condition, um, uh, no, no question about it, because, uh, but the condition is actually for your benefit. It's, uh, he's uh, permitting you to be free. Mm -hmm. So again, your freedom is what's causing the condition. The only way God could, uh, you know, annihilate that condition is to make you unfree immediately and force you to come back. So, um, uh, you know, he has to give you the choice uh, if he makes you free um, to come back. And so it's really, you are given a freedom, but that causes a condition, uh, namely repentance, uh, to coming back. But if you didn't have that condition, you'd have a much worse condition mm -hmm. that God would be forcing you to do uh, everything that you do, uh, the loss of your freedom completely. So it's a condition which really replaces a much more uh, onerous condition. Okay. It's the condition that allows you to be free. In the section, I believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, you talk about crucified under Pontius Pilate, and we talked about the creed, I guess, and so the question says, uh, why do you suppose Pontius Pilate's name was included in the creed, and is it just because we want to blame him for everything? What's the reason? <laughs> because it really is a, an historical record. Okay. The whole idea, you know, Christianity was very concerned uh, to put this within a secular historical context that could not be denied. And so they basically said, here's the guy who did it, right? He is a Roman procurator, and he lived during the reign of Tiberius. And that is a very documenta mm -hmm. uh, documentable historical fact. Now you can say, well, can you prove that Jesus was really there? Well, if you'll take the word of Tacitus mm -hmm. and you'll take the word of Josephus, two people who were completely hostile to the Christian church, mm -hmm. Tacitus actually says that Jesus suffered the extreme penalty, that is crucifixion, under uh, the procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. And Josephus actually says that Jesus was a, um, a wise man that he did perform miracles or mm. deeds of power. And uh, he also died um, under Pontius Pilate uh, during the reign of Tiberius. So again, that historical marker comes up again and again. And when hostile sources living at the time of Jesus actually testify to his existence, that's a pretty good witness. So I think it's reliable to say um, that Jesus, uh, that there was definite historical evidence right. for Jesus, for his crucifixion, for his miracles, and for his wisdom during the time of Pontius Pilate. Okay, one of the other topics that I know is popular on the show is near-death experiences. In your book, so God So Loved yeah. the World, you discuss a correlation between the new transphysical form of near-death experiences and Jesus' risen appearances. Can you elaborate? And yeah. we were also talking about then tying it into the Shroud of Turin. Exactly. I mean, Jesus' uh, risen appearance, of course, is, um, you know, goes beyond uh, the spiritual appearance. So during a near-death experience, we are transformed uh, into, you know, a, 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 what I'm going to call a soul body or a spirit body that is not subject to physical processes and structures. So you can go through walls, you can defy gravity, your vision is 360 degrees around, at least in a lot of cases, uh, it is definitely, um, uh, you know, it's a very special kind of vision. So yes, there's a lot of transformations in our body. Obviously we are alive when our physical bodies are dead. That's another big transition. However, we are not the glorified body of Jesus. The mm -hmm. glorified body of Jesus appears not just in spirit, though certainly that. Mm -hmm. And we do, um, you know, our, um, you know, when we are, um, you know, experiencing near-death experience, we do come back in spirit. But then, of course, he's appearing in glory. Mm -hmm. He's appearing in power. It is so remarkable and so powerful uh, that the apostles are bowing down and worshiping him. John's calling him Hakurias, mm -hmm. the Lord, calling him Hatheos, my God, you know, the God mm -hmm. of me, etc. We can see that uh, 
uh, John. Um, I mean, um, also uh, uh, Luke is, uh, you know, addressing the, the fact that he has a power that is utterly frightening. Mm -hmm. Matthew is saying not only that people are worshiping, but Jesus is saying full power and authority on heaven and earth have been given over me. Now, here's the deal. Uh, you know, you compare those two spiritual bodies, and then you've got that Pauline statement. And Paul's statement is what? He says, hey, you know, uh, when we return, we're going to be like him. Mm -hmm. So in other words, that near-death experience we're seeing, okay, we are living uh, beyond our physical body. Okay, uh, we've got a spiritual body that's not subject to physical structures and processes and laws, uh, like gravity or, you know, walls. Now, on the other hand, though, Jesus is much, 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 mm. much more than that. Uh, he's glorious. He, he's, he's almost a, a theophany. He's powerful in addition to being uh, spiritual. Now, when you look at that, what does that mean for us? We will be like that, too. So after, you know, the final judgment, mm. uh, the, 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 the kind of the spiritual bodies we have are going to be transformed into what might be called the glorified or glorious and powerful body of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So there is kind of two phases here. Uh, of course, love is the uh, uh, operative word. Mm -hmm. I mean, during this transition period before uh, the final judgment, uh, we definitely uh, still abide by the code of love and the, 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 the love that mm -hmm. uh, God shares uh, with us. And you can see that Jesus talks about that very much. Um, in, his, in the scriptures, and we can see that the loving white light that many people encounter is very much a loving being similar to the one described by Jesus. Many people identify that loving white light with Jesus himself. Right. Okay, very good. One more question. Hopefully we can get this done in a couple of minutes, but it's a tough one. Sure. How, would you explain, how would you explain transubstantiation to a materialist since there is no evidence of molecular yeah. change? That's right. So molecular change is merely the change of the appearance of the thing physically. Mm -hmm. So the idea of substance uh, that we take from Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas is a very different thing. Uh, that substance uh, refers to levels of being, levels of activity and power. So, uh, for example, the physical level, which you're talking about when you talk about molecules uh, and the, the molecules aren't changing, that's just the lowest level mm -hmm. of, of substance for Thomas and, and for um, uh, uh, Aristotle. The next level up, of course, is, is the, you know, the rational uh, substance of the soul. The next level up is uh, the spiritual substance, uh, you know, of the glorified body. The next level up is the angels, and the next level up is God. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the, the Eucharistic host, we're talking about the highest level of substance. So when we talk about transubstantiation, mm -hmm. yes, the appearance, which is embedded in the lowest level of substance, namely physical substance, right, the molecular structure of the bread that is consecrated, that remains the same. There's no change in the accidents, the mm -hmm. appearance. However, the real substance is not uh, simply our, uh, you know, rational soul. It's not just the glorified, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, soul body. It's not just the uh, angelic. It is Christ Himself. Mm -hmm. It is the, the God Man, and the substance now is is translated into the very highest divine, unrestricted spiritual substance that has come to be incarnate. Yes, but also remains. Mm -hmm his divine personhood. It remains his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Mm -hmm. So that is a transition in substance mm -hmm. that doesn't require, uh, the, uh, you know, um, a change mm -hmm. in the accidents that are in the bottom layer of substance, mm -hmm. namely the physical substance. That's the fastest uh, I can That's give good the explanation. There, you, you can what get, it, okay. Yeah. You can get on the Catholic Blitz with that one. Uh, I tell you, it's the, uh, <laughs> let me just ask you in our closing moments, uh, why don't you mention a couple of the books yeah. that recently have come out that we hope to be able to do some interviews on in the near future? Sure. So I have one on Christ, science, and reason, mm -hmm. um, what we can know about uh, Jesus, Mary, and miracles. Uh, that book, um, you know, goes through 
a lot of different um, uh, miracles. It, it gives you a complete scientific explanation of the Shroud of Turin. Um, it uh, goes into the carbon dating much more explicitly. Uh, go, we have the uh, um, uh, Eucharistic miracles, goes into the scientific investigation of those, goes into the Marian miracles, particularly looking at the new um, evidence that's come out on the Tilma of Guadalupe. I take a very close look at Stanley Yockey's book, uh, on um, the God and the Son at Fatima, uh, that, that's a really excellent uh, explication of the miracle of the Son at Fatima with all the uh, eyewitness testimonies. Mm. It's a really long book and a complicated book and a thick book and it didn't quite get the, the attention it deserved. So I really wanted to bring that uh, Son, the miracle of the Son at Fatima uh, into, fruition, uh, into focus with all of Stanley Yaki's contributions. And finally, of course, the miracles at Lourdes, which continue to happen to this very day. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just point out about six or seven of the really spectacular ones that happened. And by the way, they happened, many of them, uh, not just with the Lourdes water, but in combination with a blessing from the host mm -hmm. in, in, in a Eucharistic procession. So I wanted to uh, kind of get all those things uh, secured. And then I have a whole uh, appendix on of the Catholic Church's involvement in science uh, throughout the years. Okay. So that that's a, a, a book that really uh, I hope we can talk about. And yeah. then I have another one that uh, uh, comes out that's called uh, um, a Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. And that's kind of the book that lies at the basis of the new Science, Reason, and Faith uh, study Bible um, that uh, I have done for the RSVCE, uh, the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition Bible. Uh, that's being published by OSV in uh, March and April. But the book, the precursor that explains the analysis that I give uh, throughout the Bible mm -hmm. is given in that book, uh, Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. Well, well Father, we're going to have to do another show just so you can list the books that you've already written, let alone the ones that are coming <laughs> soon. So thank you so much. Always a joy to be with you. The one and only Father Robert Spitzer, S.J., his book, Father Spitzer's Universe, Exploring Life's Big Questions. They're big and there's great answers. Check it out, published by EWTN, naturally available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, and you can assume I highly recommend it. I'm Doug Keck. This has been EWTN's Bookmark. We'll see you next time. Thanks.